thank you all for dropping in this morning to uh, join me for a little time with history. Uh, welcome here. This is Joe Long, and I'm continuing our series of morning talks. Uh, our Heroes on Zoom series is actually based on a book. wonderful book. Here's my copy of Hero Tales. Uh, Hero Tales by Theodore Roosevelt and his best friend Henry Cabot Lodge, two enthusiasts of history, whose project was, their project was to try to explain, especially for young people, uh, but I think really for everybody, uh, through short tales of adventure and courage drawn from real history to explain what it really meant to be an American and uh, to promote some virtues. Uh, they believed that history was the best way to do that. So I think it was not shocking, not surprising at all, that among the heroes of Lodge and Roosevelt was a historian, if we want to be pretentious and historian. Uh, you see the image in my background frame today of a three cent postage stamp dedicated to a man named Francis Parkman. And Francis Parkman is the subject of our little talk today. Uh, a neat guy, an interesting guy, also an interesting selection for these men to have chosen to make. Uh, battles, battles and leaders in struggle have been our themes, they've been our subjects. Uh, Roosevelt and Lodge established for us early the virtues of the frontier the tough life that made a man tough as he rose to the challenges. And then conflict, commanding men in battle. And then in a couple of cases, we've seen them choose different battles. We just did um, uh, John Quincy Adams and the right of petition. And his battle is a verbal and legal and moral struggle not carried out uh, with bayonet or glass of grape shot across a wooden deck. Nevertheless, it's a struggle and he triumphs. We also did the Governor Morris session where violence threatened, the threat of violence was important, but the one-legged Governor Morris would triumph by moral courage. Well, today we have a very, very different setup indeed, as we look at the life of Francis Parkman, American historian. Here's Parkman, and on his death, this gentleman received the tribute. Hold on a second, folks. I like to be sure when I'm sharing that you actually see what I'm sharing. Share screen. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Upon his death, Frank, Frank, uh, Francis. Parkman would receive a poetic tribute from no less than Oliver Wendell Holmes. He rests from toil. The portals of the tomb close on the last of those unwearying hands that wove their pictured webs of history's loom, rich with the memories of three distant lands. Who taught the old world what what who taught the new world what the old could teach? 
whose silent hero, peerless as our own, by deeds that mocked the feeble breath of speech, called up to life a state without a throne, as year by year his tapestry unrolled, what varied wealth its growing length displayed, what long processions flamed in cloth of gold, what stately forms their flowing robes arrayed. Well, the picture there in those couple of verses pulled out of Holmes's poem is of a storyteller who put rich robes on history, uh, who made history into something inspiring and beautiful, not by changing it, not by making up falsehoods, uh, but rather by telling stories well, telling true stories well, and pulling from them themes of bigger truth. Uh, something I think is the historian's craft. Uh, the writer for, not for other professors to read necessarily so much as for the people in general to read and have a sense of history. So this gentleman, Francis Parkman, who receives these accolades as, as a great historian and a great writer from Roosevelt and Lodge. Let's see what they have to say about it. The stories in this volume deal for the most part with single actions, generally with deeds of war and feats of arms. In this one, I desire to give, if possible, the impression, or it can be no more than an impression, of a life which in its conflicts and its victories manifested throughout the historic qualities. In this one case, they take a break to say, hey, the hero we're going to talk about here is a hero. Such qualities can be shown in many ways. And the field of battle is only one of the fields of human endeavor where heroism can be displayed. Francis Parkman was born in Boston on September 16, 1822. He came of a well-known family and was of a good Puritan stock. He was a rather delicate boy with an extremely active mind and of a highly sensitive nervous organization into everything that attracted him, he threw himself with feverish energy. This little boy that Roosevelt is considering perhaps reminds him of his young self. Theodore Roosevelt too struggled with having a, a frail constitution as his parents were told when he was young that he probably wouldn't live to adulthood. And Roosevelt, too, threw himself into every activity that he undertook. In Roosevelt's case, including um, trying to get in good physical shape, trying to improve his health. And young Francis Parkman undertakes the same sort of thing, what Theodore Roosevelt would praise as the strenuous life. A passion for the woods and the wilderness. Out of this came the longing to write the history of the men of the wilderness and of the great struggle between France and England for the control of the North American continent. And Francis Parkman is going to be uh, the great historian of his era of what we call the French and Indian War. All through his college career, this desire was with him. He also spent a great time, deal of time in the forests and on the mountains. To quote his own words, he was, quote, fond of hardships and he was vain of enduring them, cherishing a sovereign scorn for every physical weakness or defect. So he challenged himself um, and even slighted the precautions of a more reasonable woodcraft. 
tired old foresters with long marches, stops not for heat or for rain, and slept on the earth without blankets. And in undergoing these wilderness hardships on purpose uh, and being vain of them, in other words, being proud of how much extra trouble he put himself to, um, he first raised himself to a, a stronger level of, of physical constitution and then went beyond and began to suffer for it. And in later years and worse health, as he wrote about his strenuous life, um, he didn't want to discourage others from undertaking the challenge. Maybe don't overdo it like I did, he suggests, but quote him, if any pale student glued to his desk here seeks an apology for the way of life whose natural fruit is that pallid and emasculate scholarship of which New England has had too many examples, it would be far better this sketch had not been written. For the student, there is in its season no better place than the saddle, and no better companion than the rifle or the oar. So, Parkman is suggesting to young scholars, if they want to be distinguished scholars like him, that part of what they should do is get out of the classroom, get out of the library and the study and challenge themselves physically. And in Parkman's case, that's gonna include graduating from college and law school. Uh, he felt that the time had come for him to make a serious investigation on the spot of the West. He went to the Rocky Mountains and after great hardships, living in the saddle, as he said, with weakness and pain, he joined a band of Ogallala Indians, uh, better known as the Ogallala Sioux or the Dakota. With them, he remained despite his physical suffering and from them he learned, as he could not have learned, in any other way, what Indian life really was. The immediate result of this journey was his first book, The Oregon Trail. So this is the point, as I look this over, that I, I realized that I wasn't unfamiliar with Francis Parkman because I had read first in a children's version, actually, um, Parkman's Oregon's Oregon Trail, which is a book you can still find out there. It was probably the basis of the famous video game Oregon Trail as well. So Parkman's writings, the things that he wrote down, uh, the legacy that he left. In uh, one thing about him is in American hero tales as they write for an audience, mostly of young people in 1895, that, that they sort of figure the name Francis Parkman will be one that young people have already seen, that they have read, if nothing else, The Oregon Trail, that they may have read um, his Mount Palman Wolf or other selections from his many writings about the French and Indian War. Another thing about Parkman's writings, as we said, he went out to experience things on his own. Um, something very common to great writers. Um, uh, J.R. Tolkien uh, is a soldier who has been in the trenches of World War I and seen great battles and an inveterate hiker and outdoorsman who spent a lot of time in the ancient forests of Europe. Uh, a, a writer and particularly a historian should not be insulated from the natural world in there opinion, opinion I happen to share. Uh, Parkman's writings put the United States in a historical context. And you might think that Roosevelt and Lodge writing about what it means to be an American uh, would have chosen a historian who wrote um, things that happened after the birth of the United States of America. Uh, but no, they are recommending um, a man who spent most of his time 
working on uh, the period of the French and Indian War before American independence. Another thing about Parkman, the man that they're praising here, if you were to go to look at Parkman on, say, Wikipedia today, uh, you're going to find a lot of criticism of him, both for being a man of his time and, and writing from the point of view that, that uh, he had, his thought in history, uh, but also for another controversy that Parkman became well known for. Uh, he would write um, from his point of view as a historian. He had points of view on current issues and events, too. And one of those current issues in his time was the issue of women's suffrage. And Francis Parkman would be one of the most uh, eloquent uh, writers and, and framers of an argument against women's suffrage and would be um, long after his death continued to be promoted as uh, for pamphlets that he wrote setting forth what he believed were the arguments against expanding the franchise. So in this book for young people, they didn't, uh, Roosevelt and Lodge didn't say, well, this guy really takes a point of view in a controversial issue. Uh, he ought to, I don't know that we should include him. Um, they don't talk about that controversy at all in this little essay, uh, but they don't consider it a disqualifier either. The biggest thing that they really emphasize in the essay, remember that part at the very beginning, such qualities, that is heroic qualities, can be shown in many ways. The field of battle is only one of the fields of endeavor where heroism can be displayed. And as well, we see in that poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes, halting with a feeble step or bending o'er the sweet breathed roses which he loved so well, while through the long years his burdening cross he bore, from those firm lips no coward accents fell. Well, that long struggle is going to have to do with the um, physical conditions he was born with, aggravated by the very strenuous life that he had uh, carried out on the plains. Unfortunately, the book was not the only outcome of his Western adventures. The illness incurred during his journey from fatigue and exposure was followed by other disorders. The light of the sun became insupportable. His nervous system was entirely deranged. His sight was so impaired, he was almost blind. He could neither read nor write. It was a terrible prospect for a brilliant and ambitious man, but Parkman faced it unflinchingly. He devised a frame by which he could write with closed eyes and books and manuscripts were read to him. In this way, he began the history of the conspiracy of Pontiac, a history of the Pontiac War. And for the first half year, the rate of composition covered about six lines a day. His courage was rewarded by an improvement in his health and a little more quiet in nerves and brain. In two and a half years, he managed to complete the book. He then entered upon his great subject of France in the New World. The material, mostly in manuscript, had to be examined, gathered and selected in Europe and in Canada. He could not read. He could write only a very little, and that with difficulty, and yet he pressed on. He slowly collected his material and digested and arranged it, using the eyes of others to do that which he could not do himself, always on the verge of a complete breakdown of mind and body. In 1851, he had an effusion of water on the left knee, which stopped his outdoor exercise, on which he had always depended. All the irritability of the system then centered in his head, resulting in intense pain and a restless and devouring activity of thought. He himself says, the world, the confusion and strange undefined tortures attending this condition are only to be conceived by one who has felt them. The resources of surgery and medicine were exhausted in vain. When the pressures was lightened a little, he went back to his work. When work was impossible, he turned to horticulture and grew roses. 
As he grew older, the attacks moderated, though they never departed. Sleeplessness pursued him always. The slightest excitement would deprive him of the power of exertion. His sight was always sensitive. At times, he was bordering on blindness. In this hard-pressed way, he fought the battle of life. He says himself that his books took four times as long to prepare and write as if he'd been strong and able to use his faculties. If this should have been the case, it's little wonder. His books came into being with failing shattered nerves, with sleeplessness and pain and the menace of insanity ever hanging over the brave man who carried them through to the end. Yet the result of those 50 years, even in amount, is a noble one and would have been a great achievement for a man who had never known a sick day. In Parkman's volumes is told vividly, strongly, and truthfully the history of the great struggle between France and England for the mastery of the North American continent. This is not the place to give any critical estimate of Mr. Parkman's work. It's enough to say it stands in the front rank it's a great contribution to history and a still greater gift to the literature of this country. All Americans certainly should read the volumes in which Parkman has told that wonderful story of hardship and adventure, fighting and statesmanship, which gave this great continent to the English. But better than the literature or the history is the heroic spirit of the man which triumphed over pain and all other physical obstacles and brought a work of such value to his country and his time into existence. There is a great lesson as well as a lofty example in such a career, the service which a man rendered by his life and work to literature and his country. And here we see in Boston, a memorial to Francis Parkman, uh, the great historian. So, a little out of the ordinary line of the hero tales, and I think that's all to the good uh, that Francis Parkman is selected in here is, is a message to us that goes in a couple of different directions. One of them is that History is important, but the study and composition of history is a task um, that is to be put right up there with the struggle of John Quincy Adams uh, for the right of petition. Uh, that is, the quest for truth is to be up there with Governor Morris saving refugees from the French Revolution or with Stephen Decatur sailing into an enemy harbor uh, to uh, destroy a ship. Uh, that the study of history is worthwhile, important, something to invest a life and talents in, is something that Lodge and Roosevelt very much believe. The other theme in this selection in American Hero Tales is that some struggles are personal and private and not carried out on the big stage against human opponents. Uh, that Frankman, Francis Parkman's struggle against his ill health, uh, against his um, blindness, uh, against his splitting headaches, against all sorts of things that don't have the drama in the story of um, rowboats full of English sailors and Marines coming to capture your privateer, uh, but rather are something carried out over a long period of time with no glory to it, uh, that this too is a place to exercise the heroic virtues uh, and make your life worthwhile. So thank you all for spending about half an hour this morning with Francis Parkman and I, if you'd like to dig into reading some of his stuff, many of his things are free online these days um, and can also be gotten other places. The Oregon Trail may be his most lasting single volume popular work. It's also something that's available, as I mentioned, in 
children's versions, including illustrated children's versions. So that's a good place for you. 